We've already looked at one nice example of how all this wave properties of light can be put to use, and that was in understanding our ability to resolve two sources that are far away from us, to be able to see them as separate sources. And now let's consider another one, and this is a device called a diffraction grating. A diffraction grating is really nothing more than many, many slits put adjacent to one another. We've talked about the two-slit experiment. That was how we began our study of the wave properties of light. And now let's imagine adding more and more and more slits while keeping them the same distance apart. And so we're going to have lots and lots of them. The light will come in, as usual, from the left and will be incident upon all these slits. And what we want to do is ask ourselves what will happen on a viewing screen at a particular angle theta measured from the horizontal direction. Well, this is really easy to analyze because the entire diffraction grating, this collection of many, many slits, can be paired up into individual pairs. So every slit has a partner adjacent to it, and the path difference for the light that travels through those two slits is exactly the same as it is for just two slits alone, right? Uh, if you make that little triangle, as we did back when we were dealing with the case of double slit interference, if D is the spacing between two adjacent slits, then the angle theta is the same as the upper angle in that small right triangle, and therefore the path difference, the extra distance that has to be traveled by the light coming from the lower slit, is simply D sine theta. And since we can apply that logic to the next set of pairs moving up, and then the next set after that, as well as all the pairs below this point, then the condition for constructive interference is going to be the same for all the pairs. And that means if the path difference is equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength, with the wavelength of light coming through the slits, then we'll see an interference maximum. We'll see a bright spot on the screen for a particular wavelength. So what does that look like? Well, for constructive interference then, d sine theta is an integer multiple of the wavelength, where m is any integer. And here is a schematic diagram of what that would look like on the screen. So we have light coming in through many slits at an angle theta. This here shows the angle theta corresponding to the first maximum for the interference pattern. L is the distance from slits to screen. And so this equation d sine theta equals m lambda is applied in exactly the same way that we earlier did for the double slit experiment. Now, what's different here is that in the case of the grating, a lot of times we won't know exactly what d is. What the manufacturer of a grating will tell us is how many lines they put down, uh, how many lines they, they uh, cut through the screen, and rather than being able to tell us the spacing between them, they would say, well, there are a certain number, hundreds or thousands of lines per centimeter. And n in the equation here means the number of lines per unit length. So that d, the spacing between any two slits, is simply the reciprocal of n. So when you have problems or applications of the diffraction grating, you might be given the number of lines per centimeter, and you'll want to convert that into the number of centimeters per line, which is basically the spacing between any two lines. So we can see that there's more than just one uh, interference maximum. You have m equals 0, 1, 2, and then of course in the lower part you'd have negative 1 and negative 2. In the language of diffraction grading, uh, we call these different values of m the orders of the diffraction pattern. So m equals 0 is the zeroth order maximum. m equals 1 is the first order maximum. m equals 2 is the second order maximum, and so on. And one of the things that sets diffraction gratings apart from just the ordinary double slit experiment that we considered before is something that we can notice just experimentally. We don't really have to even understand where this comes from, although that could be done as well. But if d is small, and that's the whole goal in making a diffraction grating. You want to put many lines together, and you want to make their separation very small. But you can see right away that if d is small in this equation, since the right-hand side for a particular choice of m, maybe m equals 1, uh, is, is a constant, 
If d is small, then theta gets large. It has to in order for their product to be a constant. And a large theta means that these fringes are well separated, that there will be a large angle between the central one at theta equals zero and the next one. And that's important when we're using a diffraction grating to analyze light that comes from a source that has many different wavelengths instead of just a single wavelength. Something else that we notice is that the width of these interference fringes, which is the same thing as their sharpness when we visually inspect them, that depends on the number of slits in the grating. And so if n is large, the number of slits th that you have in your screen, the larger n gets, the narrower and sharper these fringes get, and they become much easier to distinguish from one another if you were to have two different wavelengths uh, going through this, the grating. So if there's more than one wavelength present, then the effect of a small d and a large n is that the locations on the screen where you will see the interference maxima for those different wavelengths will be well separated or well resolved by the grating. So that's what a diffraction grating is in practice most useful for. Taking a source of light that has more than one wavelength, maybe many different wavelengths, letting those uh, wavelengths then pass through the grating and appear on the screen at different locations. And so we can take the light that's initially mixed up and all coming from the same source and separate it out into different wavelengths. You might already know that a prism is one way of doing that. And that's a familiar separation of sunlight into a rainbow of colors that it's made up of. The diffraction grating does exactly the same thing, but it does it in a very different way. And the diffraction grating is more useful to us because by adding more lines and by making the slit spacing shorter and shorter, we can get better and better resolution of the wavelengths of light that come from the source. And now I'd like to do an example problem that shows how this stuff can be put into practice. Okay, let's do an example of a diffraction grating problem. And this is exactly what a diffraction grating is used for. When you have a source of light that contains more than one wavelength, the source might be a glowing flame or it might be light from a distant star, and you want to separate those wavelengths out and find out what the components of the light are, a diffraction grating is very useful. So here's a simple example. Only two different kinds of light, one with red, a wavelength of 660 nanometers and the other blue light with 430 nanometer wavelength. These are incident, as you can see in the sketch, on a diffraction grating with 5,000 lines per centimeter. So what we want to do is find the angular separation between the two wavelengths in the first order spectrum. And by finding this angular separation, we'll be able to figure out whether it will be easy to determine a difference between these two wavelengths or whether they might still be very close together on the viewing screen. So take a look at the sketch. Here we see the light coming in and we've got, of course, two different colored arrows to represent lambda 1, which I'll use to be the smaller of the two, 430 nanometers, and then lambda 2, the red, which is 660 nanometers. And so what you see here uh, in this sketch is actually similar to what you'll see on the screen. Uh, in the straight ahead direction, which would be theta equals zero, all of the different wavelengths come together in the central maximum, and they're still all mixed up, and so we will not resolve separate wavelengths. If the source was from uh, the sun, for example, there would just be one very, very bright yellowish uh, peak at the center. But when we move away from theta equals zero, and go to the uh, larger angles, we see that for first order, and that's what this first set of peaks represents, for n equals 1, the red and the blue have been separated. For n equals 2, they get separated even more, and so on. The central peak, of course, represents n equals 0 in the diffraction grading equation. All right. Well, we want to look at first order, because that's the smallest angle at which we ought to be able to see these two peaks at slightly different angles. So let's figure out what those angles are. Remember that the diffraction grading equation is d sine theta equals n lambda for 
the bright peaks, right, for the bright fringes, for the intensity maxima. So in this case, we want to look at n equals 1. And really, all this problem amounts to is figuring out from this equation, all right, well, d sine theta for the first order will just be lambda. That's for n equals 1. And so what we'd like to do is solve for the two different angles. For lambda 1, where we'll find the sine of theta 1 is lambda 1 over d, right? And then for lambda 2, we can solve separately because it's a separate wavelength, but we use the same equation to find theta 2. And then we just compare those two angles and see what the angular separation is between them. And that'll simply be the, dis the difference between the two angles. And if I know d, then the problem is basically finished. We just have to plug the numbers in. But what's d? Ah, we're not given d, are we? What we're given is n. n is the number of lines per unit length. And in this problem, n is 5,000 lines per centimeter. So you might say that this is the density of lines, how many lines per centimeter there are. It's pretty easy to see, uh, as we've already discussed, that d is simply the reciprocal of this. Because if n is the number of lines per centimeter, d is the number of centimeters per line. In other words, the, the spacing between adjacent lines. And so 1 over n here, well, that's easy. That's just going to be 1 over 5,000 lines per centimeter. And so what we get with that number is 2 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per line. And I won't put the per line there. I'll just mark it down as centimeters. But it does occur to me that since these wavelengths are given in nanometers, and those I'm going to convert to meters, that I probably want to express the uh, separation between the slits in meters as well. So before I even go any further, I'll use the conversion factor. And remember how conversion factors work. I want to get rid of centimeters and replace it with meters. And so my conversion factor will be 1 meter over 100 centimeters. And I haven't changed the value. I've just changed the units by doing this. So the centimeter term cancels. And I basically just divide this number by 100. So it becomes 2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. That's the separation between the slits. So now I've got the numerical value that I can plug right into the equations for the sine of theta 1 and the sine of theta 2. So sine of theta 1 here, lambda 1 is 430 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, because a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9. D is 2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. We should get an answer that's dimensionless here. So we get 0 0.215. And here, when I take the inverse sine to get theta 1, I'm going to express my answer in degrees because I have a little bit better uh, intuition about how large degrees are. Radians, I'm not that familiar with. So when I take the inverse sine, I get theta 1 is 12.4 degrees. So that, that's the distance the angle will be uh, measured from the horizontal. So if I sketch that on here really crudely, right? if I could sketch a straight line there, uh, that would be the angle uh, theta 1 that would take me to the blue line. And now I'm going to calculate the angle that takes me to the red line, which will be, uh, we can see because the wavelength is larger, it's going to be a little bit larger, 660 times 10 to the minus 9 meters over 2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Evaluating that, we get 0 0.330. And then taking the inverse sine gives us the angle 19.3 degrees. So the answer to the question is theta 2 minus theta 1. And we can see if we take that difference, we get 6.9 degrees. So that's the answer to the question. But the reason we're asking the question is to know whether we would be able to detect the two wavelength lines at 
significantly different angles. And so we see they're 6.9 degrees apart, and that's going to be a pretty large separation. So these, we would expect, would be relatively easy to distinguish on the viewing screen, or simply with my eye, if I'm looking through the diffraction grating myself. Uh, by contrast, let's say that I did this uh, problem, and because of the particular value of D for the diffraction grating, maybe these two angles were only different by a fraction of a degree, maybe one-tenth of a degree. Then it might be much more difficult to resolve them as separate lines, and they might bleed over into one another, making it difficult to see uh, what the component wavelengths of my source would be. So uh, this is what the diffraction grating is used for. If we know the uh, separation between the slits, which is D, and then we can measure, for example, the angles where we find the different components on a viewing screen, we can work backwards and find the wavelengths. That's the way a diffraction grating is most useful. But this shows how to use the diffraction grating equation in a relatively straightforward problem.